now being recorded. Um, and particularly helping schools establish their gardens and keep them running over the summer, um, helping them teachers with workshops in the spring and fall, and we expanded to include wild food walks, so taking leading trips out on the trails and forests beyond the schoolyard to look at uh, our edible plants, and uh, we run a summer camp. So that's just a little bit about Groundbreakers, and we're always looking to um, to partner and expand our uh, our influence. Anything else to add to that? Oh, that sounds wonderful. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah, today our presentation is about outdoor learning, and we're, we're focusing on a new teaching partner. So we're saying, let nature be your teaching partner. And we're definitely hoping that this will uh, inspire you to go out um, more regularly and enjoy nature with your students or your children or whoever you work with. So we're focusing on three different kinds of field trips today. So we've got the five meter field trip, which is ideally a school garden. Um, it could be a community garden not too far from the school or someone's uh, neighborhood garden. And then we also have the 500 meter field trip, which is a walking field trip where there might be a woodland or a, a park or maybe even a uh, marshland. And finally, we'll talk briefly about the busing field trip, which could be five kilometers away or a little bit farther. Uh, maybe maybe deeper in the woods where you would find wild foods and uh, other fun things to do. So we've um, found maybe eight things that we thought would be best practices for outdoor education and we also have after the eighth best practice a couple other slides just to um, to finish it all so. and like some resource suggestions um, and tips and tricks and things so we'll we'll get to those too so we'll just alternate yeah uh, between all these best practices so the first one would be to be aware of your expectations okay and this, oh sorry just gonna, oh, oh want to read through yeah. oh, sorry <laughs> Yeah, so expectations is important for us to uh, to go into our outdoor learning session, and we also um, want to understand the power of of being outside uh, in children's learning, and so that's where we talk about concepts of feeling of first and state of flow. Mm -hmm. And then we highly recommend telling as much as possible inside, and then doing and being outside. Mm -hmm. And knowing your space, obviously, um, we can plan well, but even just even if you don't plan, no, understand that you have a space that you can work with, as, with nature being your teaching partner, but what that space can provide you. And then we strongly believe that routines will help you go out regularly. So we'll have a bunch of those um, for you. And then helpers, of course, is our dear topic of do we have enough support to help to be with this, us and our students outside, and uh, we'll expand on that. And then, of course, the farther you are from school, the more important it is to have our risk management and safety first scenarios. And then lastly, pre-visits goes back to also give you some tips and things to think about uh, and knowing your space and, um, yeah, knowing what you can have in your back pocket for helping with your lesson out there. So yeah, we want to start off with expectations. So as you can see, we've we've said managing outdoor learning starts with managing our own expectations. And I think we just want to emphasize through our talk that the more we can feel um, comfortable uh, and not overwhelmed, that it doesn't have to be overwhelming to go outside, then the more we can successfully get out there and routinely have our students exposed to nature. Because um, it seems like even no matter how much we can prep and have support for outdoor learning, just having that routine is so valuable um, because, again, nature is our teaching partner. And um, whether it's in the garden five meters away or just beyond the schoolyard 500 meters away. And I think often about the fact that even in the garden, like I'll go out with uh, a goal and our expectation of am I planting seeds today to have a product of a successful harvest in June, or am I planting seeds today for a process so that the students are just experiencing the feeling of the dirt and looking at the seeds and what goes along with putting seeds in the ground. And, um, and I think that's really important for us to work on having expectations that match our circumstances. Circumstances being our own energy, the class's energy, 
and we're going to give you some tips and tricks how to work with both. Um, and I think also, Len, speaking about expectations, we were talking about the idea of you, you and your students grow into your expectations. You have a concept of graduating your class. Right, right, absolutely. So we start small, and it could be just five meters for a few months until I find that they're working well in a group. They are gathering quickly for redirection, and they're not interrupting, and they're on task. And then I tell them if they've graduated or not, and then they're all excited because then we get to go to the 500 meter field trip and so on and so forth. Yeah. And so this um, slide talks about some of the things that aren't, that aren't as researched about outdoor learning. So we know it's good for our mental health. We know it's good for uh, physical health. And we know it's great to change where we do some learning with the children. But little research is spoken about really what that does to a child um, in terms of state of flow. So I'll start with that one and Jen can talk about the feelings of first. So state of flow is that that piece where we have no concept of time. We're not interrupted by the, the school bell or the fact that we need to go to the gym because it's our time for PE. It's where the child can just sit and draw or the child can whittle for as long as they need to finish their piece or look for bugs in a very weedy garden. And so that is an understated um, benefit of outdoor learning, is to just enable the child and the adult, in many cases, to just be and not be interrupted. Yeah, I think we've seen, whether it's the garden or another outdoor space, that unstructured, self-led uh, discovery, um, unstructured teaching, is is so valuable and I think of the the power of feeling something for the first time um, we all know uh, a feeling of doing something for the first time to be with us for life so that I just want to emphasize that even if you don't feel like you're prepared going outside and just digging in the dirt in the garden can and finding that bug really does um, open up a, a valuable teaching time for the students and I just want to add the story about the potatoes because <laughs> Groundbreakers manages three school gardens in Smithers, and we offer workshops, but we also have a summer program. So sometimes we harvest things for a summer program, and sometimes for the workshops. And, and one year, we harvested the potatoes before the workshops, and the one teacher was so disappointed because her kindergarten students wouldn't get to go dig for potatoes. And for her, that was a huge deal, like she still talks about it today, how the first time she saw that first student who'd never seen a potato under the ground. And for her, it was so important to provide that experience to her students. I thought that was a really neat uh, mistake that we made, and then we haven't done that since. <laughs> so this is pretty straightforward. If you've been outside at all, you know that it's very distracting to give direction and explain things, so you do as much as possible inside. And I've included a, a couple bullet points there. So any vocabulary about the day, any groups that you're going to uh, put together, buddies if you're doing a buddy system for safety, any challenges or missions if you're going to be looking for something, and what are the goals for today, what's going to be uh, done outside, any outdoor behavior rules, because as we know, um, being outside shouldn't be that different than being inside, but it might be in certain, certain cases. Um, obviously, making sure that all the children have what they need to, to go outside, whether it's their bum pads, clipboards, pencils, field guides as they get older, magnifying glasses and such. And I always encourage the bathroom break. And then outside. Um, yeah, just uh, reviewing some of the rules once you get out there, right? And I always like um, a lens phrase when we're out on the, on the trails is to remind kids that they, this is not recess. You will have some unstructured free time and snack time, and it'll be really cool when you can do that, but this is not recess at this moment when we start off. Um, and that, um, that yeah, you've talked to them about the hazards, like bears is a, is a really big thing for us in the north, and we just be open and honest about that, and, um, and that's a really good way to get the kids to pay attention, <laughs> <laughs> and that's part of uh, identifying the boundaries and um, teaching the facts and knowledge. I mean, you have experience. Mm -hmm. Well, that part is mostly so that we don't forget the same things we teach inside. Mm -hmm. um, 
we can teach outside. So facts, I, I like the idea of the Arnica plant. Uh, what is it good for? So that would be a fact. It's good for bruises and sprains. And um, to demonstrate a, a, a skill would be to identify that Arnica amongst the dandelions and the other yellow flowers. And then how, how do we model and develop positive attitudes around uh, medicinal plants, for example, or um, uh, edibles, wild edibles would be to be so excited about seeing them in the forest and being happy that we're not inside and explaining all the values around uh, leave no trace conservation and picking plants that are um, prolific. Like we have that rule of one in 10. If there's 10 of something, you can pick one. If there's 100, you can pick 10. And that really helps for other people to um, experience the beauty of Arnica and other plants. And so once you've been outside, you come back inside and always remembering to bring the outside inside for those days that we can't go outside, whether it's too cold, too rainy, or we have other things to do. And I like having a display table. I like having a bulletin board where there's pictures of what we did or maps of where we've gone and or maybe like bar charts of what uh, we've recorded, whether it's weather related, measuring snow related or any other observations. Oh, and I forgot the journal. Very important for any gardening program, but also for any other outdoor education program. It is a wonderful tool that you can do every subject with a journal. <laughs> and just um, a very quick summary is the harder the activity, the more information is given inside before going outside. Um, the first picture is uh, children harvesting garlic, which was not essential that we describe that activity before. Uh, however, as you go towards the right where there's children in a uh, tarp shelter, there were, was quite a bit of information about what they needed to do and how they needed to do it, which knots they needed to use. And then everywhere in between building a fire, doing math with a, with a dice, a dice, a dice, plural. Um, so yeah, the more complicated the activity, the more information should be given inside. Right, so now moving back outside and knowing your space. And with the garden, um, the first two bullets, I think, are critical in um, our experience is where we found that garden beds, if you have a place for your produce, your flowers, um, whatever you want to have edible or growing in the school is great. And then also have an area in the garden that might be dedicated just for that unstructured uh, gardening or unstructured self-discovery time. Because um, we've found over the years, whenever we've had a mound of dirt or empty boxes or shavings to put in between the beds or compost, that attracts a lot of attention and it's a really, um, it's really exciting to see the kids just use their gross motor skills. So I feel like if you have any opportunity where you're, you're working is to help uh, pre-design your space, like divide divide your space into some of these, these areas. Um, also know your garden space uh, is by signage. And so uh, like the New Han School Garden, every teacher that uses a box, it's identified as being that, that class's box. And then the, the boxes that are there with a lot of the herbs, which are wonderful to have for just grazing on, are identified as grazing boxes. You're welcome to to, to this box. Uh, students participate a lot in creating their signs, especially the signs that might have um, pictures or words, whatever they choose to say, don't pick or don't walk in it. There's stuff growing. And I loved um, uh, Mrs. Embacher at Walnut Park last year, just made a craft of making um, flowers out of egg cartons to then plunk in all the garden beds, especially where we planted some seeds or we didn't want anyone walking in them to show that actually we're using a craft to represent flowers. So uh, that's a, a really um, good part to helping keep the garden manageable when you go outside, is to have it uh, divided up and, and signed. You want to speak mm -hmm. to the other three points? And for me, because I, I try to graduate the children into bigger and, and better activities and skills development, I like that we have an area for where we I will redirect the group to something else. And if they know exactly where to find me or to find what the next supply is going to be or what the next tool is, um, it's really more efficient. And so I really like knowing where all my stuff and where they have to hurry back when I do my little signal. Um, 
it reminds me how I find that the gardens and garden boxes at school gardens, it's, it's a pretty small space for, let's say, a full class of 25 students with lots of exuberance. So it, it's um, knowing your space beforehand really helps. And, and having stations or parallel activities, like, like you say, you know where they can go and grab some shovels or they can grab some chalk to do a chalk drawing or have some seed catalogs or something. But that's the trick about gardening is, is dividing your spaces as well as dividing your class so that um, that energy can be well focused. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then we see in the in the middle middle picture here, um, they're just building little concrete plaques for the garden, and we were going to set up this awning, really really big, twenty five minute set up awning, and then realized why would we do that? We have shade right there from the school. So that is really, uh, it took us a little while to figure that one out, a couple of days, but we did. And then um, a place to write. We and Currently in this garden, there's no place to write and the children found on their own a place to write. But definitely having clipboards um, would have been handy in this case. So, but maybe some gardens have a better bench system or maybe a picnic table close by. And I, I do encourage those, that infrastructure to be built near the gardens. So in terms of the forest, um, I try to use as much as possible natural natural um, supplies or I want to say ingredients, but anything that nature provides so that I don't have to bring it with me or bring too much with me. So I love hills because that's a place where the children and students can sit and I can speak if I need to introduce a new activity and then they can see me. And I love stumps, fallen trees, and rocks so that people can sit and write or balance or pretend they're statues. Um, of course, moss is comfortable for a pretend nap or to do observations through a sit spot. And then I really enjoy when there's a, like big conifer trees because you can do read aloud under these beautiful spruce trees or hemlocks and they're just great natural shelter. I also love when trees are spaced maybe 10, 12 feet apart so we can hang a hammock or make some tarp shelters like you saw in a previous slide. And then of course, for anything related to math or art, you can use branches, rocks, leaves, spruce, or pine cones because those are great loose parts for all sorts of activities. And I, I even love like suggesting poetry when we just found and find an object in the forest. And yeah, the middle picture is just, we do have stone soup days in one of my programs, and that is just the table where we put the bowls until we have completed the soup. So yeah, using the forest is uh, always a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, yeah, we wanted to go over the idea of routines because that really helps us uh, just make it a, a practice and help, help us get outside more frequently without the worry and overwhelming feeling of are we ready for it? If we're doing it regularly, and the kids expect it, and we sort of expect it no matter what our mood. Um, and here are some ideas of especially easy things for us to do regularly that will help us uh, just get out the door. Um, yeah, maybe you want to talk about your welcome circle? Yes, yeah, so um, this is for maybe a longer period of time outside. I don't think going to the garden for 15 minutes would require uh, this much of, of a greeting, but definitely having a place for it. But if you're doing a, a longer outing, whether it's a couple hours or a whole day, definitely having a welcome circle because it's so great to get to see everybody. And you can reiterate the rules and the boundary, boundaries and what you will be doing for that period of time. And then Jen loves the sit spot. She's like the pro in sit spot. Oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's sort of a couple of different skill activities. But is um, I, like I said, if, <laughs> it's really easy just to ask the kids to whether they're in the garden or, or lying on the lawn in the schoolyard to just be on their tummy or then flip onto their back and just to quietly see the world from those, those different perspectives that we don't usually usually have. And then if we happen to be in a forested area, the value of having that time in a game of hide and seek of just sitting there and waiting until someone counts to 20 or 30, uh, it's amazing what kids, what we all can observe, just having a little bit of quiet time. So just making time for for unstructured quietness is, is great. Mm -hmm. And then I really started appreciating roles, especially in a big class of 24 students. Well, for me, that's a big class, but it can go up to 30, where I have groups of five or six students that have a particular task for the day. One of them is to be the scribe. So they'll record any data for us, any observations. 
I also have a group that's the caboose. So they're in the back. They're making sure that nobody's left behind or anything is left behind. There's the tea makers that prepare, like, boil the water and put tea bags into the thermoses and make sure the cups are, are available. And then I have people carrying supplies because my backpack is already pretty heavy. So someone might carry an extra bag, um, maybe with art supplies or digging supplies. Mm -hmm. And then in general, I've just included some very simple activities for making it more regular to go outside, especially in the garden. Measuring plant growth is a pretty simple thing to do that you can do every other day. Snow depth in the garden too, as well as anything sensory, like Jen was saying, that garden bed that is not needing to have anything grow in it um, can just be, be great for shoveling and playing with um, bare hands and even bare feet. And soil sifting, soil temperature measuring, all those are fairly, fairly simple and can be done regularly um, on a weekly basis for sure. And looking for bugs in that perfect garden bed is, is awesome. And um, we also like color swatches, paint swatches, because you, you can always have that, those in your back pocket. And, oh, today it's a, different, it's a different season. Let's try to find different colors. So pretty nice. And then, of course, the rest of the routines are simple. Uh, there's so many games out there that you can do. You can do PE outside uh, almost all year. You can do read aloud under those beautiful trees or in the sun if that's what we need, vitamin D. And, of course, art outside is a pretty special, if you want to do some um, uh, beautiful landscape Im images. And back to journaling, super nice to have. You can do it outside or inside, tea time. So I have a picture here of, of um, two of my students. We do tea time every single time we meet. And whether we're in a snow cave, <laughs> in this case, they're in a snow cave, or on, on the trail or near a river. And then, um, of course, leave no trace is really important to make sure that we are following the checklist. There's no little tiny granola wrappers or juice box straws or anything um, related to the children's, like a hat, a mitt, or a backpack. And with a welcome circle comes the closing circle where I might ask three things they're grateful for or three things that, that surprise them. And um, I do find that that's a, a nice way to finish it. And it, it's really bonding, like the children just expect it. And I have forgotten it once or twice, and they're just like, Elan, the, cir the circle, the circle. So it, it's a pretty nice, um, it's a team, a team effort to, to get through, through a whole day. And then I forgot to talk about the little, I don't know what to call him, the garden elf. He comes along often and they have to find him. And it's just part of the routine. It's part of, of what we do when we have a day with Elen. So it, it does make things jovial because where might he be hit, hiding? And he's hiding next to Sarsaparilla right now. <laughs> Right. So helpers, yes, I'm saying dear to all of us. If we could only have more support, um, it would make make life easier. And, I, and uh, we certainly agree that um, that if we could divide our classes into smaller groups, some of those teaching moments of skills and knowledge will do go smoothly. Like I said, like planting seeds or doing something that takes concentration in the garden, I've come to learn um, that I'm going to reach out to my community and particularly um, EAs. I, I have this sort of concept that I would really love to see the school district adopt an EA program where the EAs are, are, they are, are trained in gardening and that we have a, an EA that's dedicated to just taking smaller groups out of the classroom, um, two or three students at a time to come out and work with them or maybe work with me um, to do uh, some really focused stuff uh, that, um, that it's nice to really have um, that one-on-one -on -one or a uh, Six, six per, per helper. But we just were putting down some ideas of all the um, human resources that are out there and that um, I think it can be quite, uh, quite manageable to make a couple of phone calls and people are very keen to come out and help students get in touch with nature. Um, and of course we wanted to remind you that uh, nature is your teacher helper too, again. So have some, uh, have some unstructured time and just let the kids go and, and, and see what they can see. So for, for the more adventurous of us taking students a little bit farther from home or farther from school, there's a few things and I wouldn't feel comfortable without talking about <laughs> safety first. And so beforehand, it's important to know about if there's any allergies, especially children who might need an EpiPen. Um, boundaries is 
probably the first thing I talk about. And on that note, I'm a big fan of flagging tape. And I wrap flagging, flagging tape around four sticks anywhere I go and just say, you're not allowed out of here. And, it, you know, not super threatening, but I think as they understand me, the boundaries get a little bit bigger every time we go out because I trust them more. So we're just building trust. Um, for sure, when we're walking in um, 24 students and one teacher or one teacher and one parent helper, we have a sandwich formation where there's the top bun and the bottom bun and there's no olives allowed. Nobody's allowed to go in front and uh, they just have fun pretending they're like salami or <laughs> tomatoes or cheese and mayo and then they have conversations about that until we get to our maybe our first interpretive sign or our first activity. For sure, natural hazards, I, I like asking students, what's the worst case scenario for today? What are the risks? And it's funny the things that come up with from meteor showers, for our, you know, th something falling on us, and to the regular things like, oh, it might be slippery today, it's icy, or, you know, there's branches when we're bushwhacking. And of course, there's some of the plants that are not super good to touch, like the thistle, the nettle, or the devil's club in our neck of the woods. And then, not that we want to scare any, any educators, <laughs> there are poisonous plants out there, and for especially people who are doing wild foods workshops, it is important to uh, tell children never to eat anything without asking for permission first. And that has been ingrained in our students, and hopefully most people understand the importance of that. Then dangerous mammals, Jen and I went on a wild food wild foods trip where there was a bear like 20 meters away and we just made noise and off it went. We were and playing hide and seek, which is perfect. Which is, yes, well hide and sneak actually, and sneak, so we're yeah, coming closer, yeah. but um, which is a great game by the way. And then definitely for sure like garden tools, this might not be very far away from the, from the school, but garden tools can mm -hmm. be quite dangerous, spades. Uh, on shoes that aren't very, very sturdy, can help, can hurt, actually. And we totally do not recommend sandals in, in the garden. So we tell families or we send them notes home, please do not have children in sandals. And, of course, regrouping signal could be uh, your whistle or a, a, a regular whistle, some clapping or any other, um, Maybe you know the call of the loon, so you can use those things, and they become part of the routine, but also a very safe um, a way of regrouping. Oh, I forgot. We're, we've been using the countdown of numbers, so if you have 24 students, everybody's a number from 1 to 24, and as soon as you get somewhere, you count count forward or backward. They love it, and they some of them are very loud, and some of them are very quiet. And this is just an example of some of the things that we've done where can look a little bit dangerous. I mean, the first picture in the water, there's a raging river down down from that stream. And so there was a lot of trust for a whole half a year before I let the children go into that river. They're trying to build a bridge. So this is very unstructured, but very. it was very clear what their, their boundaries were and what we were going to do. The one, the one boy went floating on that log. <laughs> <laughs> but it was all clear he couldn't go past the flagging tape and and he didn't and then building fires with flint and steel there's there's definitely some some risk there but we've built trust again so that we're able to do that and then the the kind of a train or a sandwich formation below we're looking for wild plants and that's actually not even 500 meters away from Newheim school so we were able to identify eight wild plants like edibles in uh, that very, very small area, like 500 meter area. And we're, nobody ate anything bad, <laughs> but there, there is risk in that too, but it's just good to know about them. Um, yeah, so pre-visits, like, like we say, it can be time consuming, but totally worthwhile. Like, of course, we all know the more we can prep, the more we feel like we can have success. But it, the investment is that I think if you can go back um, and use your site o over and over again, not only does it help build the routine into your outdoor learning, um, it so certainly strengthens that concept of place-based learning. I think that's um, become part of our curriculum is uh, really getting to know your place. And, and um, certainly with our seasonality, it, it, there's, no, there's nothing um, boring at all about going back to the same place. Um, and um, so, if yeah, if you're able to make that investment at the beginning of the year, it certainly does does pay off. 
Um, and I think these are just some of the things that you would keep keep your eye open for. Mm -hmm. And here's an uprooted tree. I did the trail the day before this longer hike just to make sure everything was safe. And I did have to analyze that. Like, that's pretty slippery. It's pretty steep. There's branches everywhere. I knew they were going to, to be able to do it, but I did warn them ahead of time. Like, there's going to be a pretty pretty steep section. So it was. I'm very glad that I went and, and did the hike the day before. Right. So this slide just... Um, get to a little more detail some of the points we have made about trying to just pass on some of the successes we've had in our garden workshops um, and like I alluded to that the small group gardening is is beautiful when you have you can make it happen because it is satisfying to see students take on a new skill and, ha and see that sense of wonder when they put a transplant in or something in the ground so if you can if you can work with your school to uh, to have the, the support or bring people in. Um, I really, I really encourage that, um, especially when you're, if you're planning on on ha having a garden box that you want to plant. Um, the smaller the students, the larger the seeds. And I gave you some suggestions of the ones that go over really well with the younger students. Um, and then seedlings are ex more expensive, um, but there's value in learning how to transplant seedlings. And also, then it gets. Um, the garden planted earlier and so kids do get the message this is no longer something to jump in because it's been like that since the snow left in March but nothing's been in there um, especially you can buy all those little inexpensive um, pansies and, and and they're really nice to have in the garden right away um, I've found that of course the, the plants the tubers that you can dig up are really successful plants Nasturtiums are those edible flowers that become really spicy in September when they return to school and kids have a hilarious time challenging each other to eat those. <laughs> Kale is a very sturdy plant for fall harvest. Any herbs are great. Um, so for sensory exploration out there, of course, um, radishes and beans are easy to plant. Asian green mixes grow up quickly for that June salad. And the char and the broccoli can usually hang in there until into September. So, um, yeah, you can always, we're, we're going to give you our emails at the end of this, so you can always email us <laughs> or me with uh, any other ideas. Um, and then I just wrote number six, some of the uh, parallel type of activities that I always seem to sort of fall back on when I have a larger group, a, lar a full class, and I want to just divide them up so I can have some one-on-one -on -one in the garden bed for something specific like planting or a particular careful harvest, and then we have these other activities going on on the side. I've been asked what's in my backpack mm -hmm. and why it is so big and so for those 500 to 5 kilometer field trips I always have my cell phone, I always have a first aid kit, so flagging tape I forgot to say earlier that uh, if you're anywhere near Smithers there's six colors of flagging tape believe it or not and there's probably more elsewhere. If you're in the lower mainland you probably don't have problems finding flying tape but there's six colors so there could be a color for for different teams for different boundaries for all kinds of reasons so I've I've really enjoyed playing with that so I always have a whistle on my backpack Jen totally reminded me about the bandana because it's really great for all kinds of reasons eye covering bugs to tie things to hide objects or for sun protection the color swatches we've mentioned before so survival items my Heartwood program is geared highly towards survival um, skills and survival scenarios. So we have always fire starter, tinder, rope, knife, and an emergency blanket that we hope never to use. I always have a little bathroom kit. So that's always a bit of a, of a question. You're hoping a student or your own children do not need to go to number two, but you need to have a solution for that. So toilet paper with a trowel and a lighter in a Ziploc bag. And you know, the child can typically do this on their own, and but you have to help maybe with the toilet paper. Mm -hmm. And that's you know for the longer day trips for sure. I like bringing field guides. I don't bring them all the time. It depends what we're doing. I like tracking books. I like plant ID books. Um, I find the the, um, the field guides that talk about the uses of plants, like all the the his, the, um, the First Nations uses of plants, I think gets the most attention. People are are always amazed at the ingenuity humans have for using different plants. Mm -hmm. And then for sure, Ziploc bags have been very very useful in collecting all kinds of things from our nettles. To 
to make our nettle pesto, for the arnica to make our arnica salve. All it's just I just carry a bunch of them. I wash them. I reuse them. And I, I think kids are always wanting to take home a little bit of a treasure sometimes. So we're we're saying that yeah, there are plants obviously that are in abundance. I often give a little Ziploc bag to keep kids busy and say go find me a bunch of, uh, fill up the bag and make me a perfume or a cologne from the forest. And they come back and they're squishing it all. And then while I'm cooking up my wild food, I'm smelling all these concoctions that come in, out from the forest. That is a lovely thing. Mm. And I did write for picking unfortunate garbage because we are using this leave no trace mentality. We definitely always have something available, a bag available to collect the garbage. Uh, measuring tape is always useful. I have a few, a few of my younger boys who just want to measure everything. So when they want, have a little bit of unstructured time, they just measure things. And then the bump pad has been um, very, very saving grace. You can make them. You can, if you Google bump pad, it's amazing. Like do it yourself bump pad. I've just ordered a bunch of mini thermarests pads, and it's it's we much do, easier. Um, uh, where you take uh, flyers from grocery stores and you just put them in plastic bags and put some tape around. Mm -hmm. That's a, everybody can have their own bum pad. Mm -hmm. It can be as colorful as can be. And then often I do have to carry something in addition to my good-to-go backpack where I'll have the clipboards and the pencils and the magnifying glasses. And especially if we're doing some art, I will, ne I will need a little bit extra, which is one of my groups will carry that for me, which is lovely. So yes, this one, <laughs> this one is where, so Jen talked about having this garden trained EAs, which I think is a lovely idea. So that not only is, is if, if we're an EA for a particular child with special needs or a particular group, bringing them outside to learn probably is one of the best things that you can do for that child. And so, I also think like there's bigger school districts have a environmental educator and they have more time to go in different schools, different classes to do some support, whether it's in the garden or in the field trips. So that would be very, very nice to have in all the school districts. I think Jen, you've talked about Yeah, we've talked about it quite a few of these already. I think it's self-explanatory but yeah just always going back to your administration or your PACs or your school district administration is saying the more resources we have for going outside we have will reap great rewards mm -hmm. and don't be scared to ask your PAC I was a PAC mom for a few years and there typically is money because we do get um, money from the gaming gaming grant and for sure it has to be used on those non-educational or what do we call them? They're not for teacher supplies. And so a garden is a great place to ask for uh, the pack for a little bit more support. And also for busing, uh, the Muheim School Pack has a an envelope for every teacher to, I forget what the amount is. I, it could be $150 or $200 per teacher for busing. It's not a whole lot, but it, it does help one extra field trip per year to the big ski hill or one or two extra field trips to go to the bluff trails in our in our case which isn't too far last but not least our resources yeah <laughs> there you go i think maybe margo actually explained we you can have access to this presentation um and those, these are just some of the some websites that we've looked at and really liked and as well as our emails are there um yeah, the Megan Zenny site is very current. She even actually has a, quite a current list of um, of, uh, of grants that are available. The Habitat Conservation Trust Fund, that's the HCTF, has um, some pretty phenomenal resources, and more and more of them are becoming free to download, like their Get Outdoors manual, which is really great at um, emphasizing all the place-based learning uh, that, that can happen. Um, maybe we can pull up on the screen um, at one example of uh, of a uh, habitat of the uh, the lesson plan. Margo, you're going to have to tell us if you can see this. Margo, you chime in. Okay, I can't see anything yet. I just see the resources page still. So. Oh, okay. We were trying to experiment with this the other day. And I was just pulling up one of the Wild BC um, resources, downloadable resources of a lesson plan, that, and it just it gives um it breaks it all down into the curriculum competencies and big ideas and skills 
all for you, so you can really just check it all off with your learning program. I think I think they're very well they're well done. So if you want to see one of those links, well, and you have a chance here soon, they're very they're very valuable. I think I can. Can you see it now? Um, not yet. Okay. It'll be it's it'll be there. I think it's just thinking. Oh, we're trying to do a share screen function. Anyhow, so now maybe if anyone has any, I think I think we're pretty yeah. much done. So if anyone um, wants to use the chat, type in, um, use the chat bar to answer any questions. Oh, is there no? Can you not hear us? Oh, we can hear you. Oh, okay. I just thought I heard. Yeah. I saw something here. Uh, no voice. Um, so yeah, we have like about just 10, 15 minutes available for questions. Is that right, Margo? Yeah, that sounds awesome. That's great. Oh yeah, we have a great ending. Today. Oh yeah, this is the ending. Some mm -hmm. some people might not like to have like twenty four students that look like that, but it it's a pretty neat um, it's a pretty neat feeling of joy to be playing in the mud when you're six years old. So I had to put that one in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also if anyone else um, um, has wants to add, I think a lot of you probably have a lot of experience out there that uh, I'd like. We want to encourage this to be a, a forum for people to also contribute their bright ideas of what has worked and not worked. What are the challenges and successes that you've experienced? We've alluded to a few challenges, but um, I'm sure there's there's some out there. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so Please feel free to type them up in the chat box there or to unmute yourself and you can just ask them out loud to Jen and Helen. I actually have a question uh, to start us off here, Jen and Helen. Um, as we saw in the beginning, we do have some farmers and community partners uh, here on the webinar today. So what would be your advice for like if a farmer wants to have students come visit or if a community partner is looking to better support schools, do you have any advice on uh, what they can do to help support that and getting getting students outside? Well, certainly getting students outside um, is uh, is inviting them to your place. I think that's that's incredibly valuable. I mean, I think for all of us to see where your food comes from can be uh, can pretty um, influential, and um, and then uh, allowing the kids to have a, a task on a farm would be would be really wonderful. Um, and then like a community partner, like even visiting um, community, community gardens, um, I think are really interesting. I know in Smithers, I. We kind of call it the secret garden tour of Smithers because I think many of us don't even know that the capability of your community for growing food and um, and then to uh, and to have students put some money together, buy allow them to buy some some um, some produce and include that into a soup making um, afternoon or, or the next day. But having the students um, have the the from the the farm farm to fork experience would is just would be wonderful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as far as uh, community partners so groundbreakers was created to support mm -hmm. school district 54 students like k to k to seven students and jen and i write the grants and we we administer the money and provide the workshops and so basically we just went knocking on on the principal's doors and just said hi we can offer you garden workshops for free we can take your kids out into the wild for free and nobody's ever objected to that and then there's just different permission slips depending on what the um, the outing is but for sure there are many organizations like ours like we're in Smithers 5400 people and we are a little bit um, unusual but there are other organizations like this that clearly can support school districts around the province. We just don't, maybe that's what our next slide would be for next time would be to find all those community organizations that can help support teachers and um, educators. Okay. Um, oh, here we go. There's a question about the long jump pit. 
let's see, we're going back to look at a question here. Um, we have a question oh, on the chat bar. I guess maybe you guys can all read that. We have a sandbox in our playground, which can't be a sandbox because of animal waste. Right. Um, the students are not allowed. Oops. How do you answer the parents and districts with positive factors? That would be a supervision situation. Um, I wouldn't. I would agree that having shovels and trowels unsupervised is not the safest thing. Um, if the children have shown that we can trust them, it's different. But I wouldn't at recess just let anybody play in a garden bed or in a sand pit without adequate supervision. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, in some ways. <laughs> I I think there's. I think we all have to look at the, the value of a little bit of risk. I mean, like you showed us some of those slides of them in the river and, um, and playing with like starting a fire. I think, um, I think having some of that, um, that unstructured play does come with a bit of accountability of the students to look after it themselves too. And if, if it's not like a metal spike shovel, um, it might be, um, um, that's not going to cause a serious wound. I, I know. I sort of feel like sometimes having those shovels out there, those plastic trowels, can be really, um, can be really good. And I think in this case, where you have a, like a sand pit that's not, that's supposedly dangerous, well, maybe this school or a class can take a little bit of ownership of it, decorate it, put signage, make it a bit more of their own, so it's not a place that they're just being told to stay away from or it's a controlled environment. They have to take ownership of it, and that's what I like seeing when garden beds become planted or are decorated, um, and, and there's kids who feel like they want to look after it. Hmm. Yeah, those are valid points. I think it would depend on the, um, the location of this pit and as well just um, if it's going to be during recess where there's only like three recess supervisors for 300 students versus one class of 25 and one teacher. So, but I could see how that might be frustrating for um, parents and teachers who want more, more, more things to play with outside that are un, that aren't plastic or that aren't structured. Mm -hmm. But that's a great question and, and not, not a clear black and white answer, unfortunately. All right, we're just scrolling through the list. There's yeah. one here um, after. Yeah, no, it's sharing the website. Oh, okay, so sharing. Okay, so in the chat we see um, a resource and then reference. Any, uh, anybody just want to add some of their own experience? to the chat. We have one question there, uh, Helen and Jen, asking about if anyone has tried honeybees. Like when you say like tried honeybees, like having a, a, a school observation hive or having like a pollinator garden and trying to encourage, um, like I've worked a little bit with um, Silverthorne Elementary to get just to focus on a on new garden beds solely having um, plants for pollinators, and we all uh, class, students created little homes for pollinators and understood the principles of what makes good um, bee habitat. And mason bees are something that is becoming quite common and sort of uh, available to communities to even purchase. Is is that what you're thinking, Margo? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's a great theme for, for garden beds and, and certainly the, the pollinator plants that are native to your area can be very uh, carefree, maintenance free. Um, they often can be wonderfully scented and they can be um, blooming at different times of the year and they can be quite hardy over the summer. So I really encourage um, the pollinator garden and, um, and, then, um, and then like I said, it could tie into students understanding uh, the the habitat that they can contribute by creating that pollinator garden, building the little homes, and then, um, of course, the bigger picture of, of the importance of bees to our, our own health and eating and everything else that they provide for the ecosystem. 
And I think having so that's, another, that's another great community connection is I think at least anybody that I know that has a honey beehive loves sharing their knowledge from it. And of course, bringing in a sample of honey, I think community connections, um, there's bee clubs probably likely in most communities across our province. And that they're a great resource. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much for sharing, Jen and Helen. We, um, if everyone grabbed down Jen and Helen's email addresses, if you do have additional questions, please feel free to connect with them via email. We just have a couple more mentee questions that we're going to go through quick before we wrap up. So what other topics would you like to learn about in future webinars is our first one. So this is a short answer question. Feel free to just type in anything uh, that comes to mind that you'd be interested in learning about. Maybe honeybees, um, incorporating pollinators and honeybees into uh, the school curriculum might be a good one coming off that last question there. Yeah, as soon as we're finished these mentee questions, we will go back to the uh, the emails so that you can have the email addresses for Jen and Helen. We just have uh, Catherine mentioned that from the chat box just to be able to see the emails again. Okay, a couple of answers coming in there. That's awesome. So just in the name of time, because we do have about one minute left, I'm just going to jump to the next question. What other resources would be helpful to make you feel more empowered in incorporating farm to school activities into your classroom slash community? So as we allow uh, people to fill in that question, I just wanna thank you again um, for joining us on today's monthly webinar. And, and a reminder that our next webinar is gonna be happening in March. It will be hosted by the Farm to School Surrey Hub. Uh, thanks so much to Jennifer and Helen for joining us today and doing such an awesome presentation that was filled with tons of good information. And I think really, um, really good points, no matter where you live throughout the province, a lot of those techniques and, and skills can be used um, in schools and communities across the province. So very thankful and grateful that you were able to join us today. And um, please, uh, we will go back to the, the slide with their emails at the end to let them know if you have any questions. Anything else to add, Jennifer and Helen, before we wrap up? Uh, no, thanks for the opportunity. And we encourage you, everyone, to email us so that we can reach out and just give us more chance to share what we, we learn, um, what we've learned and we can learn from you too. Yeah, thank you very much for everybody's attention. Mm -hmm. Have a great afternoon.